I get asked this question over and over, which is what is going on with your dev setup? And I get why people are curious. You know, it's a little weird, even though I have a desktop and a laptop, I actually don't do work on either of those machines. I connect to a third device, which is a server running remotely. And that's where I do all of my work. So I'm finally going to answer the question. Why am I bothering with this kind of crazy setup? What are some of the upsides? And then I'm going to walk you through the exact tooling I'm using to make this a pretty nice experience. And I think when you see it, you're going to be like, huh, I might want to try that myself. So let's get right into it. My primary machine is this desktop right here. There is a 3900X CPU. There is 32 gigs of RAM, a 3080 GPU, and some SSDs that I've collected over the years. If I want to upgrade this guy, I can't just replace a CPU because modern CPUs use a different socket. So I have to buy a new motherboard. And if I get a new motherboard, then I got to upgrade the RAM because I don't want the RAM bottlenecking the system. And it starts to look a whole lot like a full system upgrade. And even if I do that, I got to disassemble it, reassemble it, take the old parts, box them up, put them up on eBay, sell them, ship them. There is just a lot of overhead with upgrading your own hardware. It might be cheaper. It was fun for a little bit, but it's not this process that's particularly efficient. When you rent a server, you can tap into the latest and greatest uh, hardware that's out there. You can get the fastest CPU, you can get the fastest RAM, and you pay a fixed monthly price for it. If new hardware comes out, upgrades are handled for you. Uh, the company will buy the new servers, set them up, upgrade you, take the old servers, sell them to other customers that want them, or sell them off to other vendors that can use them more efficiently. It is just a much more efficient process and you don't deal with the hardware upgrades. So renting is more expensive in the long run, but because of all this overhead associated with owning, I have now preferred to just switching to renting. The other nice little benefit is the flexibility. I can scale up. I can say like, hey, I'm only using six cores. I'm gonna pay for six cores. Okay, now I'm doing some more intense work that benefits from this, let me double that. I can double it for a couple months and then bring it back down. So I much appreciate the flexibility and offloading this overhead of managing hardware. So the second reason why I do this is the multi-device experience. I recently bought this device right here. This is an M3 MacBook Air. Um, it's a fantastic piece of hardware. It's new for me. I haven't used a Mac in 15 plus years because I primarily like using Linux. But with this remote server, I can now just pick the best physical device because it's just going to connect to the remote server anyway. Uh, this MacBook is really lightweight. It's got a fantastic screen. The battery life is amazing, especially when all the work is being done remotely. This thing can easily last two days without a problem. And the best part is transitioning between my devices. If I'm sitting here on my desktop working on stuff and I decide, hey, I'm going to go to the backyard, do some work in my hammock, I can just grab my laptop, go out there, connect to the same session, and I'm back in the exact same file. My little cursor is in the exact same spot. There's no configuration to sync over. There are no files to sync over. I can just grab and switch between devices super seamlessly. So all of your physical devices just end up being gateways that feel great to use to this remote server where all the work is actually being done. How do you go about actually doing this? So the first step is obviously to find a server. Um, to start small, you can just use a VPS provider. These are companies that rent virtual machines instead of the whole server. So you can just pick up like four cores and eight gigs to try out this setup. And it won't cost you that much at all. And you pay by the month. So if you don't like it, you just stop, stop paying for it. Uh, the way I would recommend searching for a provider is to search the latest desktop CPU, uh, let's say like a 9950X, and then the city that you're closest to, and search VPS provider. You'll probably find a bunch of VPS providers that uh, are there that can sell you something that's pretty affordable. The reason I say desktop CPUs is that server CPUs are a lot more expensive and they're optimized for different things. Uh, for like personal use, you tend, you'll tend to find like higher clock speeds in desktop CPUs and there are people that will rent that. So I personally don't do that. Uh, I have a full dedicated machine that has been donated to us by Reliable Site. They are a fantastic dedicated server provider. You will get the fastest CPUs, the just the best setup that you can possibly find anywhere uh, in a bunch of major cities for a very reasonable price. So they have uh, kindly sponsored me and my work. So uh, I use that full machine, but then I will cut it up into a bunch of different virtual machines. I use one for myself. 
My wife uses one. I'm the first man in the history of the universe to convince his wife to use Arch Linux, but I've done it. I've set records. I've pushed the bar. Um, so I'll cut that machine up into a bunch of different virtual machines. Buying a VPS is effectively someone else having done that for you. And we'll jump into uh, my full setup, which is you know going to be that managing that full machine, but then most of it will be dealing with the VM that's that's inside of it. So once I have the server, the first thing I install on it is Tailscale. So Tailscale is pretty popular now. You probably have heard of it. It is a way to create a virtual network across all of your devices, no matter where they are. So you can have some devices in your house, your phone, which is out all over the place. You can have this remote server and it creates one big mesh network to let them all communicate with each other as though they were all physically on the same network. It is one of the best pieces of software that has ever been released. It's so reliable. It just works. I absolutely love it. It just has like a ton of fans. Um, so first thing I do is I install it on my server and I make sure, you know, my local device also has it set up. So once that's set up, the only thing I really need to do in terms of security is to set up some firewall rules. So there is something called uh, UFW, which I think stands for uncomplicated firewall. Uh, and if you look at the rules I have set, I just say, you know, allow anything from tail scale and that's it. Everything else is denied. So any inbound traffic from anywhere else is just totally denied. If you try to, if you figure out the IP of the server and try to directly connect, you will get rejected. The only devices that have access are the ones that are in your tail scale network and they can access it by name. So this one is, this server is called Challenger. I name all my servers after various ships or spacecraft. Um, and I can just do SSH Challenger from my desktop or my laptop and I will immediately get in here. So like I mentioned earlier, I manage a full server and cut it up into VMs myself. And I use this tool called Cockpit, which lets me create virtual machines on the server. So you can see that I have uh, two virtual, or oh, I have three here. Uh, this one is my wife's, Rhymeless is mine. I also have a Windows machine that I mostly have off, but I will use to debug various things. Um, so if you go into my server, you can see I've allocated some CPU, I've allocated 64 gigs of RAM, I've allocated some disk, um, and I can manage everything here if I need to do some kind of manual intervention. When I first set this up, I install Arch Linux on it. Um, I can do this all through this little VNC console that's right here. And then I also set up tail scale on this VM because again, there's no inbound traffic allowed to this VM because it's sitting inside of the server, which itself is firewalled off. So I'll set up tail scale on here, allowing my machines to SSH directly into it by the name Romulus here. Um, and once that's set up, I pretty much never have to go here again because I can just SSH into it from any of my devices. So once I'm in the VM, uh, I will set up my dot files, which I have in this dev environment package. This is actually something that's been on GitHub for like probably like 10 years now. Um, there's two parts to it, I would say. We've got obviously a bunch of my configuration for things like, you know, Tmux, for things like NeoVim, all my configs in there but also all the packages that I need installed. And I just made my own scripts to manage this. I've tried various things over the years and I landed on just a very simple list of packages that I need and then an install script to install them. Um, I do this like kind of grouping thing. So I have all my base packages that I care about. So this will be stuff like uh, Node.js, um, you know, Bun, just all the things that I need on all my devices. Uh, and I also have this desktop list, which are things that I need just on my desktop. So this will be like UI applications like Chrome, um, like i3, things like that. And then for each of my devices, I have a folder. So this um, uh, this is my server that I was just showing you. Simlink the base, which contains all the base stuff. And there's some like Romulus specific packages I have on here. And this is my desktop, which you know has base and also my desktop. Uh, and this install script will just, based on the current you know device that it's on, it'll install the list of packages that are matching. Um, and I have some other scripts to like figure out if I've installed anything manually that it needs to get added into this list and to clean up anything that uh, was installed manually but I don't want anymore. So it's synchronized with this list. So once that's there, the next thing I do is set up Tmux. So I'm gonna connect to an existing Tmux session, but normally I create a new one. Uh, Tmux is the terminal multiplexer. It's what lets me create a bunch of sessions for my different projects, have different windows in them. It stays up even if I disconnect uh, from the server. So if I reconnect from the same device or a different device, Tmux is what's making sure that I'm brought back 
to the same session to the same spot that I was in before. Uh, so if you look here, I have basically a session for each of my projects. You know, I work on SST. Uh, I have, you know, my editor. If I switch over to OpenAuth, I also have my editor with, you know, open up to the OpenAuth folder. Um, and Tmux lets you manage all these different projects. Each project can have multiple windows. You can have multiple panes. You can do whatever you want. Uh, you can also save all this stuff. So even if your server for some reason needs to reboot, it can bring all this stuff back up. But typically this will just stay up forever. And that's what makes the magic of switching devices so nice. My desktop is technically dual booted with Linux and Windows. So when I reboot into Windows and I reboot back into Linux, I don't have to bring everything up again because my server has been up and running the whole time. So the next thing is NeoVim. If I'm going to do everything remotely over an SSH session, having a terminal based editor is fantastic. NeoVim is a great terminal based editor. Pretty much in each one of my projects, the first window is always is always NeoVim and it's always opened up to you know, my project and everything that's going on in there. So any of them is great. I don't have to talk about it. There's plenty of people on here on YouTube that'll tell you all about why any of them is awesome, but it works amazingly in a setup like this. So one quirk of this setup is port forwarding. So here I have a Vite project where I brought up the front end um, and it's running on localhost. But obviously if I go to my browser and type localhost, that's not going to work because it's not actually running on my machine. But what will work through the magic of tail scale is hitting it by the host name. So if you just do Romulus 2001, which is the name of my server, that works. So you can open up your browser and instead of going to localhost 3001, you go to your server name 3001. For the most part, this will be a fine solution, but there are some cases where things really want to be running on localhost. I ran into an issue recently where it turns out that in the browser, all the crypto APIs, like crypto, even that the one that generates UIDs, they only expose it on HTTPS or localhost. So that's pretty annoying because then my app just wasn't working when I was accessing it by the server name because it was saying, you know, the crypto APIs were not defined. Um, so I do another trick here that forwards certain ports to my local machine. So if we go back to my desktop and we look at my SSH config, we can see that I have some extra settings here. So on what I'm saying here is whenever I SSH into my server, automatically forward these ports. So these are ports that, you know, a few things benefit from actually being forwarded to localhost. Uh, this log level quiet is pretty useful. Otherwise it's going to complain when nothing's running on that port. Um, so when I have an SSH session open, it'll automatically forward these ports. So if I go and access you know, something on localhost 2001, it will actually get forwarded through the server and it'll act like everything is running on your machine. So for anything that doesn't work, you can always just go into your SH config and configure this stuff here. So the last thing I want to talk about is what if something goes wrong? What if you're in a situation where you lost internet, you can't reach your server, there's something wrong with your server and you still want to be able to work. Uh, so I do have something set up to make this a little bit easier. So pretty much everything that I care about is located in this dev folder. If we look in here, it's my notes, all my projects, all of my code, just everything in my entirety of what I care about on my server is in this dev folder. I use a tool called sync thing to keep this folder in sync across all my devices. So you can see I'm looking at the my server dashboard of sync thing. It's connected to my desktop and my laptop and this third device, which I'm not going to talk about now, maybe another video, I'll tell you what this defiant device is all about. Um, but it basically creates a backup system across all my devices and it's peer to peer, right? So if I update uh, a file here and then my desktop syncs it first, and it's a big file, the third device can sync half of it from one half from another. Um, it's really cool. It's like creating your own little Dropbox, own little kind of cloud file storage. Uh, and what's nice about this is all my files are at the end of the day synced to my end devices. So if I lose internet and I can't access to my, access my server, I can always drop down and go back to working locally, editing my files locally. It's all there and it's, there's not really going to be anything that is missing because I make sure everything I do is in this dev folder. So it's nice to have that peace of mind. Like if I go on an airplane, I can't really use my server. Uh, it's a little bit too laggy. So I will drop down to accessing my files locally. So this serves as a really nice fail safe. 
And that is pretty much it. So I will put links in the description to everything that I'm using here. So you can go check it out yourself. It does take a little bit of work to set it up, but once you have it going, man, it is a really nice setup. I've been doing this for about two years now. There's no chance I'm going back. I absolutely love it. Uh, I've been through a few server upgrades as well in that time, and it's been as seamless as I expected. Uh, so I'm a huge fan. If you see anything I'm doing that you think I could actually be doing better, I know some of you are pros with this stuff. Uh, if I can simplify anything, if I could add something in that would help me, happy, leave a comment, I'm happy to try it out. Um, otherwise, hopefully this answers all of your questions about why I do this, how I do it. Uh, maybe you'll try it yourself too. So let me know if you do. Otherwise, have a good rest of your day.